So if you love your mother, just say, hey, I'm a mother lover. You're a mother lover. We should uh, give each other's mothers a Mother's Day card. Um, (laughs) But yeah, I got to admit, I've had some friends whose mothers I have found like, damn, (laughs) you need some motherly love. If we were to be in Philadelphia, I would give you more than the step brotherly love that me and your son have. Um, even if your mother has the same name as my mother. Damn, I actually miss my friend. You say he's just a friend. He's not just a friend, he was my rapping buddy. But yeah, I miss my friend. Um, but yeah. I guess like the podcast, you could say this is a message full send. (laughs) Without the marketing, the money, success, or the guest. But this podcast is a guesswork. Kind of like a, um, kind of like what are those called? A, uh, not like a survey, but like when they do polls, when they do informational marketing stuff where they invite like 20 people into a room and then they kind of do a analytic check let's just say and um I'm an analytical guy because when I see the numbers go up I'm like damn let me see what's up um (laughs) oh I'm such a fool but damn I make her kitty pool wetter than a kitty pool which is kind of ironic if you're bragging about making a girl's kitty being wetter than a kitty pool. A kitty pool is about as small of a wetness as it gets. So that's a weird flex. And you're basically flexing the fact that you barely get a girl precipitated. But I'm a guy that I like to participate. And let them feel like they precipitate. Voluntarily. Because I am a consensual guy. But yeah. Yeah. As I try to always sell to all the women I've ever been with. It's all about potential. Um, Because if you sell them on potential, you don't have to have actual results. And that is a man's best dream. Lack of results. Yeah. But yeah. We're going to episode 227 of the Off and Be Podcast with Clint Nelson. I'm your host, Clint Nelson. Don't forget to like, follow, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Most important, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to suck some titties. And yeah, uh, recording this on October 9th, 2023 at 4.40 a.m. Eastern for the archives. And I swear to God, saying the Off and Beat podcast with Clint Nelson is hosted by Clint Nelson. Is redundant, but it's very necessary. Because apparently people's short attention spans, you have to remind them to like, follow, comment, subscribe, do all that jazz and jizz and biz and let them know that you got riz. And uh, let them know that if you were to live, it would be off the grid. It was just kind of ironic that people that want to live off the grid, but they post on social media to be very out there. Kind of sounds like you want the best of both worlds. All right, Hannah Montana, how that work out? Now she sounds like a dead RCA player. Like, what do you see, Joe? Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'm a guy. I'm all about people living their life, their best life, their full life, their full potential. Um, I'm a man that's still trying to reach mine. Not to sound whizzy and jizzy and gay. But I'm a man that's trying to fulfill my prophecy. I'm a man trying to fulfill my uh, pursuit. God, I'm starting to sound like the people I hate. But sometimes the people you hate are the people that have a few words that you can relate. Um, (laughs) Right, Andrew Tate? All right. I'm not Andrew Tate by any means because as far as I kick up, There's a kick in the recoil of my thoughts. And it's like, I was never good at Call of Duty. The more 
I played, the more I said, like, man, online streaming is never going to be my future. But, you know, the thing about online streaming and video games is it's not necessarily about how good you are. It's about how entertaining. But there's a minimal level of good you have to be. You can't have a .80 kill-to-death ratio. Have 200,000 fans. And no, no one point out in the comments about, oh, there's this one guy in Sweden that's so entertaining, no one even cares. It's like, yeah, people kind of care. Um, but yeah, I'm not a gamer. The only thing I game is the fact that I want a little fame just to have a little, you know, dollar signs to my name. <laughs> but not Ty, but I will thank you later. <laughs> I'm not a masturbator, but I will crunch on you like an alligator. <laughs> Welcome to Florida. Taxes are less. But baby, stop stressing me because I feel blessed. Dear Jesus. Um, <laughs> I felt like a priest right now telling you like, hey, Jesus has come for the awakening. And you say, hey. I'm just trying to get high on life. Can I get that baconing? Um, <laughs> I'm ready for the takening. Oh, Jesus. This podcast is actually fit in the description that I actually read for the podcast earlier where it's puns. And I feel like recently for the podcast, I have neglected the puns. But I'll tell you what I don't neglect. Health care and child care. Because the more I care for children, the more Michael Jackson says, put the glove on. Drake, put the pen. Let me know when can I um, invite Adonis over. Put it like this. If Drake actually thinks he's the next Michael Jackson, right? Would he let Adonis go over to Michael Jackson's house? I don't know. Even though he used a sample. It don't matter to me. Would it matter to you if Michael Jackson was still alive and said, Hey, does your does Adonis want to come by? Would you genuinely let Adonis go by Michael Jackson's house? I'm sure you'd have a couple qualms about it. Because I know you'd be afraid that Michael Jackson, I don't know, beat it. Alright, this is getting kind of weird. Um, <laughs> you might tell Michael Jackson to... Beat it, bud. Um, I got more hits than the Beatles. Or actually, he said, I got more slaps than the Beatles. It should be more like, I got more slaps than Ray Rice in the elevator. Even though that was more of a punch. And this is a puncher's chance of getting some views and listens. But you know what they say. Behind every pounding is a... um. Dax Shepard Extra at the Groundlings. I used to watch the Armchair Expert podcast, right, with Dax Shepard. But I've realized over time, I get really annoyed with interviews that are very pretentious. And I'm not saying that Dax Shepard is pretentious. I'm not saying that interviews with celebrities interview other celebrities are pretentious. I'm just saying they're not really relatable. And I'm really saying... I don't think people really care about your come up. I don't think people really care about how someone got to where they're at. I think all that shit is very overrated. No one's going to care eight years from now when I get, you know, two million uh, listens an episode and have all these advertisements and make bank on this podcast. No one's going to care that I used to do this podcast in an apartment that was overpaying three thirteen hundred a month. No one's going to give a shit. Of what I had to do to get here. Because why? They're going through their own problems. Why the fuck are they going to care about the come up? This whole overrated aspect. Of people thinking people give a shit about their come up. Like the only thing I care about coming up. Is the fact is. Hey. Did I hold it in long enough? Um. (laughs) Uh, the only thing I'd be holding in is anger, depression, and sadness. That took a dark turn. But you know what they say, behind every dark turn is an Amsterdam brothel. Where you're like, damn. 
Um, I'm getting a little hostile. Um, <laughs> and I could get my kinks. And after a few drinks, I can get my sneaky links. Um, but y'all know how sneaky it is if you have to pay for it. That defeats the odds of sneaky links. But hey, I'm not in that field. I don't know how you could be a rapper and have a sneaky link. As 21 Savage always says, my uh, sneaky link be riding in a rinky dink. I would think if she's giving you a lot of service, you would upgrade that rinky dink to a damn. You want to own a skating rink? Um, because <laughs> I'm on the brink of um her loss of interest. Get it? And I feel like I've lost your loss of interest, but hey. Uh, if I was a comedian, they would call me King Voss because I would be highly appreciated in the comedian world, but no one would give a single fuck about me. And then when you actually like, you know, what? all these comedians are talking about how great this comedian is. Then you look up a set and you're like, oh, these, they're not actually that good. And, you know, we all are guilty of selling people in our field of our bias of like, man, you know, these people have been grinding at it for 22 years. It's kind of weird, you know, the comedy world is a very fascinating thing. We have a lot of people that will tell you about, oh man, all these great comedians that don't get recognition. And then you hear it on like eight different podcasts. It could be a Tony uh, Hinchcliffe talking about something. It could be a Joe List talking about Colin Quinn. It could be all these comedians you like talking to consistently about something. You're like, you know what? I actually find an interest in this. I want to seek out more guidance. And then you seek it out and you're like, oh, yeah, I don't get it. It is very meh. And that's the thing, like the things that were interesting to your favorite comedians are not really interesting to you because things evolve. And I'm very in tune with the comedy podcasts. I'm very in tune with comedians in a way. Um, and this just kind of seems like there's this monocratic type of device that they want to live by. Because they always talk about how hard it is to be a comedian. That there's only like a thousand real living uh, actual w- you know, uh, profitable comedians actually make a living for themselves. And I actually don't think that's true. It's probably close to like 5,000. But there's like a 1,000 on the high-end spectrum that are making millions and billions of dollars. The thing is about comedy is like, it's one of those feels if you hit it big, oh boy, you hit it. But nowadays, comedy is one of those things where you got to have a podcast. With the exception of the Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle is the unanimous exception. And maybe a Louis C.K. where your comedy is so undeniable that you don't have to go on a podcast to constantly put shit out there for people to remember how good you are, relevant are. Or you're talking about the art of something. And that is something I've come across recently. Is I love watching comedy podcasts with comedians. And I think Joe Rogan is an example of someone who expands outside of comedy with his real opinions, his real thoughts on things. But I got to be honest, I've never watched a Joe Rogan comedy special. And by all means, what people say about it, it's like, eh, it's uh, it's all right for the most part, but it's pretty, eh. But then when you hear him talk about it on his podcast, comedy, it's like, you know, there's just this thing that like, they're killers, man. You know, you always hear podcasts talk about, man, these that guy's a killer. Like, they know everything about the history. They know everything about what makes funny funny. And you listen to them and you're like, oh, some people are better about real life compared to writing down and making scenarios and incorporating real life to interesting topics that people want to listen to. And I think I've realized that... Um. There's just been recent controversy with Sasan Minaj. So apparently he kind of fabricated. Well, I would say it's more than a fabrication. He literally said that there was this deadly chemical that got on his daughter, his newly born daughter, and they had to send her to a hospital. And the thing is with comedy, right? 
is that we know everything isn't true. There's a lot of fabrication and blah, blah, blah. But there is a line where if you're going to talk about something, you know, maybe don't bring your kids or being burned by acid in a way. I forgot what the exact chemical was, but it was the chemical where he had to take his daughter to a hospital. And it's a it's not really the story within itself that other comedians and people have a problem with. It's kind of the fact that the angle he was going at it with had the more to do with a virtuous kind of a SJW, as people say, which basically means uh, virtuous. Um, <laughs> it had to do with a victimization of, oh, I'm going to tell a side of the story that makes me, makes you on my side from a victim or from a submissive standpoint, that it takes your objectiveness of whether the joke is funny or not. And that's the thing with a lot of comedy these days, and I think there was a lot of controversy with the, um, I think it was Gerard Carmichael, where he came out as gay or whatever, and he kind of made a whole special about how hard it was coming out as that. And a lot of people have criticism that, is this really comedy special or just a sit down talking about how you feel about how hard it is being gay and then putting some jokes in there to call it a special. Now, look, I'm not a special comedy expert, you know, to each their own. If people like it, people like it. But the thing about this Hassan Minaj thing that a lot of other comedians in the immediate field have trouble with is that the extremism you did to get people the guilt on your side to not build an objective point of view of what was wrong or whether the joke was good or not, you built a submissive, I guess, point of view where people had to automatically give you the benefit of doubt. It's kind of like when someone says they have a, you know, a disability of some sort, you have to be like, oh man, like I guess I have to spend the next three hours with this person or I'm a dickhead. It's like if you don't laugh or if you don't agree with the joke, you're kind of an asswipe. And to come out that the angle had to do with a lot of favoritism, had to do with a lot of of, um, putting people on a side that they have to really enjoy or that they have to approve of what he's doing. And if they don't, they're kind of an asswipe. It kind of puts people in a non real unobjective standpoint where they're just kind of they just you know human nature is you side with things that you feel bad for it's like no one's gonna laugh when they hear my newborn daughter or my two-year-old daughter however old she was had a chemical exposed on her because a fan or not a fan but a person, a hate mail was sent, and when they opened it, some chemical caught on her that could have killed her or really put her in a bad situation. No one's going to laugh at that. But when you put it in a special that's supposed to be funny, and the punchline is more of your daughter's pain, it's like, people are like, man, like if you're going to do that, that shit has to be next level funny. And I listened to the whole thing. It wasn't worth all that. Like, if that, I guess I always look at like, if that was my kid and that happened to me, my first instinct wouldn't be like, man, let me put this in a public podcast or a public special and then make a joke out of it. Like, that's something so, like, really serious. And if you wanted to make a PSA about why it's fucked up that people feel so emotional about your opinions at the expense of your family, that would be more of a acceptable thing. Like if you made an Instagram video or YouTube video about like a genuine heart to heart about like, man, like this really like shooken me up type of shit, that would be more relatable than making a bit out of it that you profit of, of your daughter's pain. And then it comes out the find out that oh it was not really real it was actually fabricated none of it really happened it was just to point out that hey a lot of people don't really like me and people have problems with my opinions it's like well Hassan Minaj is someone who actually has like or had I don't know if he still does have a a late night comedy show kind of like a John Stewart a John Oliver a 
Trevor Noah type of thing he had going on. I'm not. I don't really get those shows to be honest. I think this is very basic political commentary that's predictable depending on the network you watch the bill mars probably does it the best because at least sometimes he has a panel of genuine objectiveness and has an open debate or topic about things even if you know what he stands on it and these other people it sounds like they just have their monologue to just take it down but never actually be pushed on it and then they edit around their convenience it just kind of feels like a the thing is, is I don't understand if you're a true comedian, why you would want to do a political show. It doesn't really fall in line. I guess the money-wise, maybe popularity, you're going to grow, expand to a different audience. But I think it's, I think the thing is, is when you do those late night shows, like the Jimmy Fallon's, the Conan O'Brien's, who are I guess they once did a form of comedy, but I don't think it is stand up the way that Trevor Noah or like uh, John Oliver or like uh, Hassan Minaj did, for example, where they do kind of like that Comedy Central, that HBO hybrid thing where it's like they're still considered comedy, but it's more of a late night political show where they have 18 different writers. They don't even have their own original thoughts type of thing. I don't know. It's kind of a weird thing, but um. It kind of feels like once you do that type of show, you're basically selling the fact that you're not a real comedian at that point. Like your objective of your goal is not about stand up. It's not about writing jokes and making people laugh. It's about selling a point of view to convince or sell a narrative to the masses of what's right and wrong. So... Like, think about the, like, you really think, like, a Jerry Seinfeld would do a show like that? You think a Dave Chappelle? Regardless if you find Jerry Seinfeld your cup of tea, he's one of the most successful people of all time. He did do a TV show. So did Dave Chappelle. All of the best comedians in the world have dabbled in the TV world. Because at one point in time, for financial reasons, it probably made sense. If they had controlled the show, like, Jim Gaffigan had a... Uh, show for himself, you know, like they're comedians, successful comedians that people like Bill Burr had a uh, animated show and he kind of has like another thing going, he kind of dabbles in acting, but, and I think ever since Bill Burr has dabbled in acting, you kind of see like the specials aren't really that interesting. I like, I'll be honest, like I'll be, I'll be honest. Paper Tiger, the one that came out a few years ago, I did not like it. It was, I, after like 20 minutes, I'm like, oh, this is not, I don't feel that uh, all you people are the same vibe or other comedy specials he had. And I think there comes a point in your life where it's like you get to a certain point of personal life where you have a family and stuff and like all that animosity and anger that makes us gravitate to you goes away. And I think, honestly, podcasting really is taken away from people's want to and just time. The time commitment it takes to do these things away from their act in a way. But, like, I don't want to be one of these podcasts that talks about people's acts. What I will say is I think people like the Trevor Noahs, the John Olivers, the, um, uh, who's the fucking guy I've been talking about? Um... <laughs> Yeah, this guy. Um, it just seems like... Oh, Hassan Minaj. It just seems like that... Um, Their focus isn't really the funny part. They're trying to sell a sympathetic narrative for as much people to like them and follow them and to keep being interested in them as possible. And I get it. You know, it's kind of like the Drake... Kind of like the Drake thing in music. It's like Drake is so big that he has to appeal to a likable audience. He has to appeal with his music more than just what he truly believes in the core of why he got into that. But, you know, I don't know. Maybe there's some I don't know. Um, But... Jizzy Jazzy Jeff, because I am the Fresh Prince of 
expelling the air out of the room. Yeah. But any, any woo. Um, so, what do you call a wild bear in the Kentucky forest? I guess you could say he's going bear mode. <laughs> and he's got skin in the chicken game. Do bears eat chicken? You know, we have a fry, you know, we have fried chicken all over the place, but we don't have fried bear. But we do have Nick Bear. <laughs> uh but yeah. Woo! Uh today's sponsor is Duncan. I know we're about like twenty six minutes in. But Butter Pecan Duncan. I gotta admit, the last video I posted a couple days ago is almost up to 50 views. Now, I'm not someone that tracks the views, but you know, I check every couple days when I'm uploading my new shit. I'm like, wow, the boy is uh, moving up in the ranks. <laughs> and I'm like a legion of skanks, because. I'm like, damn, girl, nice Spanx. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I've never been a big fan of Spanx. I got to admit, I love when a woman wears. Actually, I got in this conversation with my lady the other day. So, does a guy wear leggings? Like, if they weren't athletic fit, you know, tight fabrics of some sort. Are they leggings or are they athletic pants? I guess if they're see-through and it has a very lady vibe. Like if you see the see-through in the back hamstring or in the crotch area, you're probably wearing leggings. But if it's fully just like a consistent texture, I think it's just athletic joggers. It's funny the terms, these pants, these clothing companies come from these pants and these type of pants when it's all the same. Like, I don't know, like, I remember I was going through a phase where I was going to, like, JCPenney, American Eagle, and stuff like that. And I learned a, f a thing or two about pants. Actually, I used to work at American Eagle, where I learned more than I ever got paid. You know, my whole $30 a week check. Think of the absurdity of that. I used to work for $32 a week when now in my job. When I'm in overtime, I can be that in like an hour. Think of the absurdity of that. Um, <laughs> but that's the thing about these clothing companies. They will put labels. They will name things. They'll call things jogger pants, boot cut jeans, wishy-washy. Or they'll say, uh, what, what is it? Uh, what is the one where it's so washed down that it basically just looks like a... Wave, I don't know. Though I have like boot cut, deep cut, skinny jeans. It's like, how can you have skinny jeans when it's a size 40 around the waist? That's like saying, uh, I'm on a low fat diet as you're feeding me a meatball sub from Subway. It's like, it doesn't, you know, there's a lot of things that don't correlate. Um, but I just feel like we're doing things too complicated. Like, shouldn't just the size of the size you choose for your body decide the type of jeans it is? Like, why is a 3432 skinny jeans different from a 3432 boot cut original straight jeans? Why is that different? It's the same waist, it's the same length. What is different? I need to get some skinny jeans, you know. But, you know, I don't know. As a guy, as a fashion expert, because, you know, I'm a man that teaches men fashion. Um, <laughs> I'm like Joseph Zuninga. I think that's his name. But it's like, you know, should you, um, should a man have a consistent type of jeans that he always wears? Or should he have a versatility? Like, should a man just have eight different pairs of straight jeans? You know, maybe various in size depending on the occasion. Or should you have like two pairs of straight jeans, one of skinny, three of boot cut, two of, you know, taper. I hate that term, taper. Why the fuck would I want 
taper jeans. There's nothing straight about wearing taper jeans. Not that it's wrong if you're not straight wearing taper jeans. I'm just saying, I don't think taper jeans as a straight male will send the right message to other males who may want to see my V taper. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm such a fool. Welcome to the VMAs, because Nicki Minaj will this year on a track, Miley. And uh, then you'll say, hey, that is the industry killing it. They're trying to put two women against each other. It's like, Miley, your voice barely sounds like you're a woman. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I guess you can have the best of both worlds. <laughs> ah, I'm such a fool. Um, you are watching Disney Channel. And Disney Channel probably gets less views than this nowadays. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, um, I like jeans. I like a good pair of jeans on a woman. As T-Pain would say, apple bottom jeans. If you have the boots with the fur. Um, it makes me think you just don't care about the animals in Antarctica. Um, <laughs> but we all know it's fake. Even though they spell it F-A-U-X, you know, soften the blow. They didn't soften the blow when they assassinated deer outside of deer season, but it's cool. No one's keeping count. Um, <laughs> I'm a big fan of Coyote Ugly, which is what I call middle-aged woman who, you know, will just suck the life out of you and will just hunt you from anywhere. Which actually, I came across a video earlier. It was from like six or seven years ago. I don't know why. I came across a couple. Mm -hmm. This uh, teacher who was 34. Who was married with two or three kids under the age of eight or nine. Was having a... Well, it started with a young man. She was a high school teacher. Actually, maybe in middle school. Damn, I, don't, I think it was like ninth grade, so it was like barely high school. Like 14, 15 year old guy on the football team. And then it turned into five dudes on the football team. And when, you know, here's the thing I'm not a lawyer, but I would feel like, hey, if you're going to be accused of these crimes, don't talk to these local news outlets. There's nothing good that could happen from it. And she decided to talk and be like, I don't see what's in, if anything, I'm the victim, you know, they never, I mean, they've admitted that they wanted to do it, it's like, yes, but they are minors, it doesn't matter if they wanted to do it or not, they are minors, and apparently her grand fucking lawyer never told her, like, hey, don't admit that you wanted to do it, um, <laughs> and God forbid, don't put it on the children, Cause let me tell you, look, it is different. I don't care what people say. It is different from when a 15-year-old boy is exploited by a 30-year-old teacher compared to vice versa. It's just a different dynamic. Because there's a different pursuit of seduction. Alright? It's not right in either way. It's both wrong. But it's a different terms of perception. It's a different... Like if my son... If I had a 14-year-old son and I found out that he was sleeping with some 31-year-old married teacher, I'd be like, I would shame her. But then when my wife was away, when we're out of the courtroom and we have a private moment when, you know, we have a nice lunch somewhere, I would be like, I just want to let you know I'm proud of you. Um, <laughs> you know, you did something I never had the guts to do. You got in them guts of the geography teacher. Um, and let's just say uh, <laughs> you pointed a spot on the map and you said, that's where I'm going. And I'm like, damn, this man's, a, you know, this kid has a pursuit to when he sees something, he wants it. Something I never had at that age. You should be proud, right? But if it was my daughter. Being seduced by some 38-year-old teacher. Which actually, I went to a school. 
with a really cool teacher that everyone liked. And after a couple months, he just disappeared. And we didn't have a substitute. We had a temporary teacher. And the rumors started going around that he was having a relation with someone at school. And all that stuff. And it kind of like people, like they kind of like didn't deny it. Like administration and stuff. It was kind of like elephant in the room. But essentially you found out by the news uh, it came on the news not too long after that he was having an inappropriate relationship with like a 13, 14 year old. And that, you know, as a father, that shit would obviously irritate me. It's different, you know, because there's nothing like, like, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the unpopular opinion people don't want to say. If a man, if a kid, not a kid, Jesus Christ, it's like if a 16 year old, let's just say 16 year old guy has a sexual experience with a, let's just say a 31 year old teacher, like that is not going to harm him in the future. I don't think like, obviously you could, I mean, you could have sex with the wrong person. When you're of age, you could be the same age as someone. Like, you could be 25 having sex with a 25-year-old. And the experience can fuck you up mentally. But the confidence and gravitas and the sack of balls that shit will put on a 16-year-old. For actually, like, being like, I can get a woman that men of her age can't. Like, there's a confidence. There's a gravitas. There's a big sack that builds on you. I think it raises your testosterone like 140 points on the spot. Like, I don't know the science behind that. But I think there's more positives down the road in terms of your success with a woman than there is negative. There's not an example. Here's what I'll say. There's not an example in the world of a 10th grade high school boy having an inappropriate relationship with a 30-year-old woman. And then he has troubles with a woman in the future. That just doesn't exist. If you can get woman at that age, like, it's only going to, like, if anything, it's only going to elevate. Like, that woman elevated your confidence where it is game over. Like, there's not, like, you're like, if I can get this fucking bitch, like, who can I get? Like, everything else is easy after that. You know? And that's the thing, right? That's the thing about validation from a adult. And that's where it kind of fucks up. But it's different on the other spectrum. Where if you have a young 16-year-old woman who is validated by older 30, 40-year-old men, there is a precedent that that sets on. Because of the dynamics between guys and women, there's a susceptibility of what that can take on. And there are more examples of a 16-year-old woman who was seduced, a 16-year-old girl that was seduced by a teacher, and they had a relationship that they shouldn't have had, where that harmed them and turned them into prostitution, drugs, lack of self-validation, and down a dangerous path, I think more than a 16-year-old guy in a similar situation. Like, the thing is, both situations should never happen, but there's a reality of the outcome of one compared to the other. And it sounds like I'm one of those people, like, oh, trying to make where it's like, it's okay for guys to get something that woman can't get. But there's just a reality of how that affects a guy more than a girl type of thing. Like, honestly, be objective. Be a parent for a second. Would you rather your son or daughter come out of that situation i'm gonna say my son because there's a lot more i think it will be a lot easier for my son to move past that than it would be for my daughter to be out of a healthy relationship i don't care how much good parenting therapy you fucking go through there's some fucked up shit that comes out of that they're gonna be one of those girls that are into dudes that are 30 years older than them for the rest of their lives and there's a certain fucked up traumatic aspect that they're always going to guide to. There's not, you know, an 18-year-old dude who dated a 
38 year old woman at one time that's not going to be the type for the rest of the life there's much more examples like guys typically will will not date women crazily older than we typically if anything it will be the other spectrum which is weird within itself like there will be here's the thing about type like that's the beautiful thing about type is that let's just say a 19 year old like a 19 year old guy will date a 40 year old woman maybe one time in life or an age gap of like 12 plus years one time in their life maybe twice but it's not going to be 10 straight times they date that woman on the other hand when they're used to a certain comfort they're used to like a guy who's in the 30s and 40s will have a lot more to get than guys in their age. Once they're introduced to that, there's going to be a, that's what they want. That's the expectation. And there's a more comfort and ease they know what they're getting into. They like an older, mature aspect. There's a better chance of a 19-year-old girl dating a 35-year-old dude and older more consistently and having that type and being open and okay with that to the public then a guy that's just like a guy typically is not going to be in the older woman let's just be honest a younger man is not really going to be into a much older woman it may be like a fling it may be a fascination it may be a thing a phase at most and maybe you meet someone that happens to be 12 years older and they're the love of your life but that's a outlier more than the rule, right? So I think overall the effect of that is a lot less damning on a guy than it is a girl. But then there was another incident, another video um, <laughs> that will negate everything I said where a woman was impregnated by a 13-year-old middle schooler and then she terminated the pregnancy. So after I said all that, I realized, damn. It's all fucked up. But I remember there was a... Not a... There was an incident. I mean, it was probably pretty long ago, but it was an incident where a 13-year-old or 14-year-old child, essentially teenager, had a baby with a teacher and she kept it. And then he's actually on the hook for child support when he turns 18. Like... Even though she criminalized and she led the situation. See, the thing is about these teacher and student, young and old relationships. It's all fun and games until someone gets pregnant. Um, Because whether if you're underage, if there's like a 14-year-old boy that impregnates a 30-year-old woman. There's fucked up because it's illegal. It's child predator. You know, all that shit. But there's some real ramifications of that, right? That kid who made a decision at 14 is responsible for something he can't even... He doesn't even have a license yet. He doesn't even have taxes. He doesn't even have, like, the basic things to provide for that child. And that adult took advantage type of thing. And the case that the people... The defense lawyer will make is like, well, do you want the child in a world without a mother? The reality is... They will make that case and make exceptions and just put her as a child predator. Can't do this and that, blah, blah, blah. But then she can't work and then that kid, that 14-year-old kid has to provide for that child. So the child's in a very susceptible situation. Um, This is a weird rabbit hole I've gone down on. Um, <laughs> but... It's all fun and games until someone gets pregnant. It's always fun and games. You know? You have a grown ass. But see, the thing is, it's like, oh, people like, um, a grown ass man impregnates a 16 year old girl, let's just say. That shit is fucking disgusting when you reverse it. Like, think about that. Because just think about the. I don't want to say think about the action, but just think about what that entails. When that child is like 12, that man's going to be 50, their mom's going to be 28. There's some weird shit to that. It's some weird thing for that kid to truly understand. 
and they're going to have, and as they get older and understand how men and women dynamic relations work, they're going to look at their mom a certain way. And they're going to respect more of what their father has to say than their mother, if we're going to be honest in that situation. Um, I don't know, man. Like, a lot of that shit is very, oh, this is why it's the Off and Be podcast, because goddamn, I did not know I was going to talk about pregnancy between completely, from people that are completely overage, completely, from people that are completely underage. It is, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, I don't know, man. Um, I guess I'll move on to something else, because I feel like I've really beating that down to a orange pulp because i'm a minute made a hey, i'm a tropicana boy in the syndicate a hey. but yeah i'll give you the longest yard of pulp fiction a hey. yeah i don't know man yeah so if a rabbit goes down the hole, does that mean it's a conspiracy theorist? Tenfold. <laughs> uh, it's 110 like I'm running a fever. Um, <laughs> actually, I think it's... I keep it 100 like I'm running a fever. Which is still better than any Drake line on this previous project. Um, <laughs> sorry, still taking shots at my favorite... Top two or three favorite artists of all time. Um, <laughs> but yeah. You know, I don't know. I guess uh, here's what I'll say. I have some thoughts about some things. So, I, uh, I really think I have gambled my last bet for a little while. <laughs> my financial situation says I should stop betting. Which probably means next week I'm going to put $15 and be like, you know what? This is the week. Here's the thing about betting, right? Like you really think no matter how many 18 filled entries you've had in a row. That you know what? If I just believe. If I just believe. And the worst part is when you make a bet on a game and the players in it. And you're like, you know what? I know I have felt all fucking day. But you know what? This one, 40 minutes before game time, I'm like, you know what? Dak Prescott's going to do all right. And he fucking shits the clitter. Um, <laughs> uh, It was a clitter fest because that man threw the ball round and round, clockwise, counterclockwise, and no satisfaction was guaranteed at all, regardless of his guaranteed contract. But that's the beauty, you know? That's the beauty. It's a gamble. But you know what? The more and more I play, I realize, like, damn, NBA season is coming up. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take a week. And then, you know what? It's like, when NBA season comes up, I'm going to be doing this shit every fucking day. And then I'm going to convince myself that during the NBA season, I'm going to win. No matter what. And I don't know. Since with my new quote-unquote unconfirmed promotion even though the winky winky faces have said i've got the job um (laughs) i'm gonna be gambling every fucking day and i'm gonna be having a gambling problem and it's either gonna work or it's not but either way i'm gonna believe because if you gamble with belief you are a man who needs some grief for his Undeniable and inevitable losses of money. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm just a man of faith. I believe that when I believe, belief will astound what I grieve. And yeah, I'm going to keep it brief. Just in case the money pops up. Ha ha ha. You know what? I'll tell you what I like about this episode. I know this is random. This actually feels like a older, vintage, classic, often be 
with Clint Nelson podcast, like anywhere from the episodes eight to like 130 ish, where I felt like I had that liveliness, that vibe, that, you know, not being too full of myself, even though I went off the same topics for like 10 and 15 minutes this episode. But in terms of the jokes, I feel on top of it. You know, there's this energy that's necessary to compete with the style that you've created. I think one thing I'm proud of is that I don't think there's any podcast, for better or worse, out there that does the style that I do. I think there's plenty of podcasts that have specific themes. Like, actually, I came across this podcast. And I'll tell you a secret thing of mine I like. I like when I get promoted, small podcasters of my type of frame of competitiveness where they barely have like they'll have like eight views for an episode that's been posted for a day or two and it's like oh there are other people with the same struggle you know and then I'll come across podcasts where they do very I came across this thing called the utopia podcast and honestly I clicked on the video because it has zero views in like an hour and I'm like oh I want to see why this podcast gets no views like mine. And I clicked on my damn, they actually have an intro. Damn. They actually have a consistency of what they talk about. They actually have a theme of the podcast where there's actually they're talking about the utopia, like creating a world of utopia and what they would do. It's like a consistent it's always these British UK type of podcasts that get promoted to me. But they have like two hundred and ten subscribers, which is like four times as many as I so I'm saying this in a compliment. Anytime I come across those in my field, I think we have a obligation nature to just subscribe and like it and be like, hey, I feel your struggle. And we are in this together. One of us is going to make it, right? And you guys got to have that continuous support. I don't understand this world of, um, you know, the, there's a fine line between competition and and being supportive of people in your field, like, this whole thing, like, oh, I'm not going to help anyone, or I'm not going to, like, show support, it's like, this is not one of those fields, like, this Michael Jordan, like, not everything applies to sports in this killer instinct, it's like, we all need to collaborate and show support to actually grow the field, to actually grow the profession, to actually grow the appreciation for what we do. Because, you know, there, there's a stat out there that there are over 5, 10 million podcasts. But let me break down the numbers. Um, Like 80% don't do more than three. I think it's like 85% don't do more than three episodes. So that kills like all of those. So really when you break down the numbers in the most recent stats, there are basically 200,000 active podcasts that post at least... That posted an episode within the last like two weeks, I think is a standard. So really when you hear that number eight to ten thousand, you also gotta think a lot of podcasts aren't really podcasts. They are there's a decent amount that are radio shows and they just post it on podcasts. It's just basically twenty two hundred thousand RSS feeds of posting a feed of stuff, right? There are people that post streams. There are people that just post their YouTube videos. on. Either way, a podcast is very loose of what it means. Not one is more of a podcast than the other. But we're just saying that your competition isn't as this big field as you think it is. But it is hard because you're asking someone to commit to listen to you. You're asking someone to commit to liking you. Like in the way you deliver the same news as 80,000 other podcasts that are hopping on what's trending now, talking about what's trending, talking about having a style that makes them relevant episode by episode, posting it on a convenient pacing of a schedule that makes people like it, right? Profession that I hope to be professing some numbers in my account in the near decade um (laughs) i don't know how many years could i voluntarily do this and still love it and not progress in terms of making it a business i don't know you know why even think about that 
I feel like the second you're worried about making a business before it's even worthy of even thinking about that, I think you're already out of it. Because if you start a podcast with the intention of just making money or making it a profitable business, unless you've already established that in a similar field when it comes to media, you know how to do it, you have to kind of master the enjoyment of doing it, right? It's too long of a form. There's, it's too much of a general consensus of your personality to fake that over and over again. I think you have to, I think it's one of the true, most truest art forms. I know there's could be the power of editing, but I think only editing can't really take out Maybe for certain times appeared in episodes, but can't really edit out your joy for the show overall. So I think podcast is one of the things it will truly expose your true intention for what you do for better or worse. So yeah, I guess on that note, I will end that podcast there because I got shit to do. So yeah. That was episode 227 of the Off and Beat Podcast with Clint Nelson. I'm your host. <sighs> Clint Nelson. Don't forget to like, follow, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell on all apps. Leave a five-star rating on Spotify. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts, you know. Help the boy out. But most important, oh, subscribe to the YouTube. Like the YouTube. You know, show support, grow the channel. But most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to suck some titties. Yeah. So, yeah. And kids, don't forget. I like sexy red, too. Me, me.